Good to be here, folks. Good to be here. Appreciate Brother Valance filling in for me last week. He did a wonderful job, as he always does. And uh, we're going to launch out into the deep today. Amen. Father, I pray, Lord, for the gift of teaching this morning. And Lord, I know our enemy hates the Word of God. I know it, and I know he'll twist it and pervert it in any way he can. I pray that you'd give me wisdom, give me spiritual discernment to know how to deal with him. I pray, Father, that you'd open the hearts of the people to receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn to Genesis 6 with me, please. Genesis chapter number 6, <clears throat> verse number 13 All right, Genesis 6, 13. There's some very interesting things taking place now. The <clears throat> scripture says, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Then he tells him to make an ark of gopher wood. And of course, Noah is obedient because he's obedient. Uh, eight souls are able to go from the old world into the new world, uh, establishing a precedent in Scripture where the number eight is the number of new beginnings. New beginning, new beginning. The gematria, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus in Greek, is 888. His number is new beginning. Now, this flood is universal flood. It comes over all the earth. It covers uh, Mount Everest, which is over 29,000 feet high. Uh, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago George Dodwell, an Australian who, through a, an extensive amount of research, came to the conclusion that 2,345 B.C., something profound happened to the earth on its axis. And because the tilt of the axis of the earth was uh, tilted to 23 and a half degrees, uh, it made some profound changes to the earth. And... Uh, the, uh, his, uh, his conclusion was that some catastrophic event uh, brought, that to, uh, brought that about. Now, of course, we know what that catastrophic event is, don't we? It's universal flood. Now, just think about all of that water that's come down on the earth and how it could affect the earth. That's a lot of water. And uh, the Bible says that the water is from above, not only from beneath, but from above. The fountains were opened up and it came down. So it tilted the earth on its axis. When it did, it caused the climate to change entirely on the earth. And uh, we have, uh, this, is, this is the typical stuff that you get here. Uh, 53 million years ago, now that's pretty, pretty accurate, give it take a few thousand million. Antarctica was so warm that palm trees lived along its shores. Now think about that for a moment. Antarctica is the coldest place on this earth. It's colder than the Arctic. And at one time, palm trees live. Now, where'd this come from? The Smithsonian, okay? If you're into secular authority, then you've got a secular authority here, the Smithsonian. And, uh, of course, the, their take on it and why this happened is entirely different from the biblical take, and that is that uh, before the earth was tilted on its axis, the earth was a climate zone, a temperate climate zone all around the, all around the globe, the, from the North Pole to the South Pole. But they have found this in, uh, in, the, uh, in this Antarctica, the South Pole. They have found palm trees. Now, of course, they date them at 53 million years, and you can get into the rigmarole about how they date things back millions of years. But the bottom line is that they admit that at one time, the Antarctica, which is the coldest place on Earth, was a temperate climate, tropical climate. That's amazing. Then have you heard of the Bereshovka mammoth? This is a mammoth that was found in Siberia uh, in the, um, I think 2000, I don't have a date here. I think I've got a date somewhere, but I don't have it right in front of me. But it hadn't been that long ago. And when they found this mammoth, it was standing upright and it had, it had undigested food in its stomach that had been quickly frozen. And here's a very interesting uh, article about this, and I want you to hear what I'm going to read for you, because 
If you do a little research into these mammoths that have this uh, undigested food, tropical plants in their stomach, yet they are in a place where it should be frozen in, the Siber in Siberia, uh, you'll be amazed at the spin that the unbeliever tries to put on this. Anything but believe that God could intervene and do something. Now listen to this article. Uh, in the early part of this century, the famous Bereshovka mammoth carcass was discovered in Siberia, nearly intact. The animal was found buried in silty gravel sitting in the upright position. The mammoth had a broken foreleg, evidently caused by a fall from a nearby cliff 10,000 years ago. Take their dates with a ton of salt, okay? The remains of its stomach were intact and there were grasses and buttercups lodged between its teeth. Remember that word, buttercups. The flesh was still edible, but reportedly not tasty. I wouldn't want to be the one trying to eat something been stuck down there. I'd let somebody else try that. Anyway, no one has ever satisfactorily explained how the Beresovka mammoth and other animals found frozen in the subarctic could have been frozen before being consumed by predators of the time. Some have proposed a sudden change in climate, but this hardly seems a likely explanation. The scientist who uncovered the Beresovka mammoth conjectured the animal fell into a snow-filled ravine that protected the body until it was perhaps covered by gravel during a summer flood, so forth and so on. Now, we go on down a little further. They give some theories, theory one, theory two, the problem, so forth. But here's, listen carefully to this now. This is a good summation. To get to the bottom of the mystery, scientists consulted experts in the deep freeze butchery industry. That'd be somebody to talk to. However, instead of clearing things up, they made them much more troublesome. Basically, they said it was not possible to deep freeze a creature of the size of a mammoth in the relative moderate temps of the Arctic. Basically, if meat is frozen slowly at freezing temp, crystals form in the cells of the flesh, bursting the cells and dehydrating the meat. The butchers concluded no such process could have produced the deep frozen mammoth meat. To, satisfactor to satisfactorily freeze a side of beef takes 30 minutes at 40, minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. To deep freeze a huge living warm blooded mammoth insulated in thick fur, they estimated that temperatures below 150 degrees minus would be required. Temperatures so low have never been recorded in nature, not even in the Arctic. This has simply made all normal theories for the Beresovka mammoth that much more obsolete. To add to the mystery, consider the climate needed for buttercups to grow. Buttercups enjoy temperate conditions with alternation sun and rain and so forth and so on. In plain words, it's a mystery. It, do, it just doesn't fit if you don't believe the Bible. If you believe the Bible, God brought such a profound shaking of this earth and changed it and created a huge frozen area that uh, either the actual frozen area or the climate that that animal was in produced the freezing or God froze it and stuck it in it. <laughs> One or the other. Because there's no other explanation. Remember what it said about slowly freezing an animal that large that the crystals would form within the flesh. And that's not what you have here. You have flesh that is just like it's been put in some kind of a advanced freezing technique that just boom it freezes it all of a sudden how did that happen it's never happened before the ice age surely didn't do that so how did it happen it happened because that there's a supernatural intervention from the almighty who changed the earth and brought it into the condition it's in today and i have no problem believing that so the earth's tilt after the flood now brings the seasons and we have the north pole and the south pole and if you stand at the North Pole and look up at the North Star, the stars are going in this direction. If you stand at the South Pole, obviously you can't see the North Star. Stars are going in this direction. 
One north are going counterclockwise, south are going clockwise. Figure that one out. In other words, if this earth is flat from one side to the other, the stars should go the same way wherever you're standing. That's an issue they have to deal with. But if you're on the bottom of the earth and you're looking at the stars, they're going to go in an opposite direction because the earth is only spinning one way. See, and the stars in relation to the earth remain fixed. And so you're, you're appear, they appear to be moving in a different direction. That's what's going on. So we have a situation where this globe that we live on has been completely changed from its original creation to the point of today. Now, I did a little research into this. I've told you that the precession of the equinoxes, about 26,000 years, to be just a little closer, the precession of the equinox comes out to 25,765 years. This is for one complete cycle. You break that down to 12 zodiac, or signs of the zodiac, 12 of them, and you come up with a figure of 2,147 years for each one of them. All right. Now, when man was put on this earth, how long ago was that? 6,000 years. So what does that leave us? That leaves us three signs of the zodiac from the creation of man to where we are today. All right. The one that preceded Aquarius, which we're entering into right now, was Pisces. And the one that preceded Pisces was was Aries. Aries is the lamb, Pisces the two fish, and Aquarius is the water bearer. And I thought, now, what's going on here? Think about it for a minute. If the gospel is written in the stars, and it is, no question about that, Psalm 19 makes that as plain as it can be compared to Romans 10. It uses the text and calls it the gospel and the preaching of the gospel. Psalm 19 compared with, with Romans 10. Paul used Psalm 19 and quoted it in Romans chapter number 10 and said this is the preaching and this was done before a written text ever existed. And the first written text was written by uh, the Pentateuch, 1400 B.C., outside of the book of Job, whenever it was written. We don't know who wrote it, but it dates to about 1900. Anyway, you have a message going on here. These represent something. Each one of these constellations, they have prominent stars that have names. God said he named them. The name that matters is the Hebrew name for those stars. Not the Latin, not the Greek, not what it developed into later, not what it's called today. What was the original Hebrew name for that star? That's all important, don't you think? Certainly it is. For example, you've got a woman with a child. It's called Coma. A woman with a child called Coma. The brightest star in her eye is also called Coma. That word in Hebrew means the desired one. The prophet said he is the desire of all nations. Don't you think there's a connection going on here? Now think about this for a minute. When you're in Aries, you're 4,000 B.C., the creation of man. Genesis 3.15 said, I'll put enmity, en enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. God promised a lamb for the salvation of the sinner because Abel brought an offering of blood and God covered them with lamb skins, teaching them right off the bat that the shedding of blood and of a lamb's blood was necessary to cover, to cover sin. Well, Ares is about the sacrificial lamb. 2,000 years later, when Christ shows up, we're into Pisces. Now, Pisces is the two fish. It's remarkable to think that when the Lord Jesus went to the cross and established the new covenant, and not until he died on the cross was there a new covenant, folks. Without the shedding of blood, the covenant is not a force. When he did shed that blood, he made it possible for men to be born again. Right? You can't be born again without the blood of Christ. And the blood of Christ is not shed till the cross at Calvary. All right. And when he made it possible for men to be born again, a man then, therefore, unlike the Old Testament saints, which says practically nothing about it, has two natures. A born-again believer now has two natures. He's got the old man. He's got the new man. Thus you have two fish. 
in Pisces. Then we come down to the constellation of today that they've been the secular world singing about, and it's Aquarius. Aquarius is the water bearer, and he's pouring this water out. And what is water in the Bible a type of? Spirit, Holy Ghost. And this, this, this Aquarius is a type of Christ who is pouring his spirit out, and that's exactly what he's doing. 2,000 years ago at the cross, at, at, uh, when Christ died on the cross, he opened up the way to heaven, established the new covenant, and the first type of the pouring out of the Spirit of God was at Pentecost, but it was limited. It was limited only to the Christian church, to the believers. Pentecost was a pouring out of the Holy Ghost. How many of you know that? Know what it's talking about? But that's not a fulfillment of Joel 2. I'll be preaching about that in a little while. It was only a partial pointing toward the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. For Joel says in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Yeah. All right, so we'll get into that later on in the message this morning. Why don't you think about that a minute? This pouring out of the Holy Ghost is what the, the, is what the bearer of the water does. And we are entering into the age of Aquarius. Here's the problem. You can't get a specific date to say that you have progressed from one constellation into the next because you're looking at a period that is slow in its transition and you have to look at it over an extended period of time. This is why they sang back there, we are in the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Remember that? The dawning of the age. In other words, it's a process for it to come in uh, in, in, in full speed. But now Ethelbert Bullinger, and if you've never heard of this man, uh, he's got an awful lot of good stuff. His, his father, I think it was, 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 was one of the reformers. Ethelbert Bullinger is a, uh, lived in the 1800s, and he wrote a number of books, quite a few of them. He wrote a good commentary on Revelation. He wrote one about the Holy Spirit, the witness of the Spirit. Then he wrote one about the witness of the stars. And he was one of the first people in the country to begin to open up the idea that God had written a message in the stars before he ever wrote it on paper. He put it up there. You remember now I told you that I'm not saying that I believe this, but I'm saying it's, a, it's, 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 it's plausible that before the flood, when the earth was covered with a canopy, it's very possible that men could not see the stars. And it was only after that tilt of 23 and a half degrees the sky now had opened, the canopy was no longer there, and they could look up into the heavens and they could see the stars. And when they saw the stars, God began to teach them in the heavens, the stars, what they meant, and they learned quickly. And also the pagans did, and the pagans got it and perverted it. But listen to Bullinger. As we approach the Christmas season, you might find this interesting. Bullinger says... Thomas Hyde, an eminent Orientalist, 1637, 1703, writing on the ancient religion of the Persians, quotes from Abul Farasjus, these are rough names, <laughs> a, an Arab Christian historian, 1226 to 1286, who says that Zoroaster, and how many's ever heard of the Zoroaster? You've all, most of you have heard that if, you'd, if you've done any reading at all. The Persian was a pupil of Daniel the prophet. Now, this is what's been said by these two. All right, now I'm only reading what they say, but follow on with me. He was a pupil of Daniel the prophet, and that he predicted to the Magians, or the Magi, the astronomers of Persia, that when they should see a new star appear, it would notify the birth of a mysterious child whom they were to adore. It is further stated in the Zend Avesta that this new star was to appear in the sign of the Virgin. That's Virgo. This new star would show the latitude, the passing at that time immediately overhead at midnight, every 24 hours, while the prophecy would give the longitude as the land of Jacob. Now let me tell you how to easily remember latitude and longitude. That's one of the first things I had to learn, try to fly an airplane. You know what lateraling a football is, don't you? You lateral it. All right, that's lateral. Latitude. Go sideways on the globe. Longitude is to go long, like you're firing an arrow or something like that. 
Okay, that's, well, most of you already know what it is. You know minutes and seconds and all of that. But a lot of folks, when you get into stuff like that, they think, what are you talking about? And, well, that's what it is. So there's a point where this crosses this. That's what leads them, okay? Where this and that come together, they follow that star, according to what we're reading here that Bullinger has. This new star would show the latitude passing at that time immediately overhead at midnight every 24 hours while the prophecy would give the longitude as the land of Jacob. Having these two factors, it would be only a matter of observation and easy for the Magi to find the place where it would be vertical and thus to locate the very spot of the birth of him of whom it was the sign, for they emphatically called it his star. And they did. You remember when these Magi, these wise men, showed up, we have seen his star. Have you ever asked yourself the question, what, number one, who they thought they were talking about? Number two, why they came so far to see him? Number three, what are they, what did they, who, why did God deal with them to begin with? Think about that. These are Gentiles. These are Gentiles. And here's something else to think about. They seem to have more interest in the birth of this child than the Jews that lived around there. Right? They sure did. Don't you think that's remarkable? So they called it his star. There can be little doubt that it was a new star. In the first place, a new star is no unusual phenomenon. In the second place, the tradition is well supported by ancient Christian writers. Now here we have him quoting ancient Christian writers. One speaks of its surpassing brightness. Another, Ignatius, who became a martyr, lived 69 AD, says... At the appearance of the Lord, a star shone forth brighter than all the others. Ignatius doubtless had this from those who had actually seen, seen it. Prudentius, 4th century A.D., says that not even the morning star was so, far, so fair. Archbishop Trent, who quotes these authorities, says, This star I conceive, as so many ancients and moderns have done, to have been a new star in the heavens. Bullinger goes on to say that one more factor would place this new star in the sign of coma. Now, we're going to get into coma right here in a minute. Okay? Coma. This is the mother and child. Consider the meaning of the names of the stars in this constellation. Remember that the Magi were very learned men. In fact, the English New Testament translation of the Greek uses the words wise men. They studied the ancient star chart. They knew the names of each star and constellation. They knew that coma meant the desire of all nations, and they were aware of Haggai's prophecy. The Magi recognized that coma represented the baby Messiah, so when a new star, a supernova, suddenly appeared in the constellation, they packed their bags. They must have been waiting longingly for this star to appear. They knew they would have the privilege of doing what so few on earth have done, worship the Savior in his condescension to mankind. Now that's strong stuff. Has, have you ever really thought about these magi? You know, the tradition has the names and says that there are three of them. We don't know how many there were. They brought, they, they brought their gifts, three gifts, but that we, we know, it could be, uh, uh, who knows, but it doesn't matter. If the Holy Ghost had wanted us to know, he told us. But they definitely came from the east. They came to the true king. They bypassed Herod. <laughs> and they went to the true king and they worshipped him. And they brought their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they laid it at his feet. Now that's remarkable, don't you think? For a bunch of pagans. In plain words, they knew a whole lot more than people give them credit. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. So this baby, Coma. There is a constellation that has a woman with a child. It's called Coma. All right. This is in the heavens. It's been there ever since God made the man. It's been there. The, the source of ancient wisdom and truth, folks, you've got to always remember this, is through the Hebrew people. To them was given the oracles of God. In other words, the Jew, not the Persian, not the Babylonian, but the Jew, the Hebrew. Say, so why is that important? It's important because other people have elements of the truth, but they've perverted it. They've distorted it. They've twisted it. 
And they do that to make it apply to their own culture, their own times, or their own ignorant understanding of it. But so you have to trace it back to its source. You've got to go back to the beginning of it. You've got to find out what they said, what the Hebrew word means. What was the tradition among the Hebrews? How did it pass down from them? What's the provenance of it, in other words? You say you've got, uh, you remember I told you this before. Uh, uh, what was his name? I swear, I can't, mine's gone completely. Jesse James. My grandfather was born when Jesse James was still Robin Banks. <laughs> I grew up in a home with a man who was born while Jesse James was still robbing banks. Now that's a long time ago, right? His mother, Zerelda, Zerelda James, was Jesse James' mother. And you know Jesse had a brother. You remember his, brother, his name? What? Frank James, all right. Frank lived on that his life. But Jesse was shot, I think, in the back of the head or in the back by a fellow named what, Tom Ford or Ford, some fellow named Ford. Anyway, Jesse James carried a Smith & Wesson. Now, back in those days, Colt, Colt, the peacemaker, the 45 Colt, was, was the favorite weapon. But Smith had a good weapon, too. Smith broke in the center, and when you broke it in the center, the, the, the rounds were ejected from the cylinder, and it, if, you could reload a Smith quicker than you could a Colt. Just break it, out they go, put six rounds in there, and you're ready to go again. And uh, he carried that weapon. Well, anyway, when he died, his mother got that Smith & Wesson. And then it wasn't too long after that that she sold it. She sold it to some fella. He wanted to have Jesse James uh, Smith & Wesson. So she sold it. I'm sure she made a good bit of money. Then she got another Smith & Wesson. Sold it. Said, this is my son's gun. <laughs> then she got another Smith & Wesson. <laughs> and she kept herself. <laughs> she made a good living on selling all those guns that belonged to Jesse James. Well, provenance, provenance is the idea that you can trace it back to its origins. If I go around and tell people I've got the gun that Jesse James had, I need to know it. it's really Jesse James' gun. Because just because it's a Smith & Wesson, I think a Model 3, I think, or something like that. Nice looking gun. Uh, just because I've got that gun doesn't mean it's his gun. All right? So when you talk about that, you're talking about provenance means I'm going to trace back to the source I'm going to get the truth, and I'm going to find out where it's coming from, and I'm going to tell you right now, I believe the Jews, and I believe their Bible. I believe it. Now, here's what's said. This pagan goddess, Semiramis, how many of you know who she is now? Now, it doesn't say in the Bible, but tradition has it she was the wife and mother of Nimrod, and that Nimrod was killed and raised from the dead, and that Tammuz became God. All right, all of this story goes back to the pagan past. It goes back to Semiramis. But Semiramis became what's known as the Queen of Heaven. And they took the term Queen of Heaven, and every culture made their own application of it because that's just the way human beings are. You got your Queen of Heaven, we got ours. You know, our Queen of Heaven's better than your Queen of Heaven. And on it goes. Nothing's changed. So Semiramis in the Roman culture was Venus. In the Greek culture, she was Aphrodite. In the, uh, in, in, among the, uh, among the uh, others, she's called Diana of the Ephesians or Artemis, Minerva or Athena, Ceres or Demeter, Terra or Gaia, that's what they call the earth, Juno or Hera, Vesta or Hestia, and Ops or Re. Vesta had a perpetual burning fire on a hearth, Vesta. These were Roman uh, nuns. They, they, wore, they wore a specific clothing, and they sat in the court of, the, of, the, uh, of Caesar. And they had enormous privilege. And if you laid a hand on a, on a vestal virgin, they'd put you to death in a heartbeat. So they had great respect for them. On the other hand, if one of them did something that was wrong, they put them to death in a heartbeat. There was a clear line drawn. All right? The vestal virgins are the Roman take on the, on the mother of God. Comes down from generation to generation to generation and is, an, is, is accommodated into their faith. The ancient Germans worshipped the virgin Hertha with a child in the arms of his mother. The Scandinavians called her Disa. 
pictured with her child. In Egypt, the mother and her child were worshipped as Isis with the infant Osiris or Horus seated on his mother's lap. In India, the mother and child were called Devaki and Krishna and also Isi and Israwa and are worshipped to this day. In Asia, Asia, they were known as Sibyl and Deus. In pagan Rome, as Fortuna and Jupiter Pure. It's become very popular at football games today to play Fortu or oh, Fortunata. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I can pick it out. I'd have to be there to show you, but they play it all the time. They're playing her song now at football games. I've heard it the last couple of years. Fortuna, Fortuna Jupiter, the boy Jupiter. In Greece, as Ceres, the great mother with a babe at her breast, as Irene, the goddess of peace with the boy Plutus in her arms. Even in Tibet, China, and Japan, Jesuit missionaries were astonished to find the Roman counterpart of Madonna and Child. Xing Mu, the holy mother in China, was portrayed with a child in her arms and the glory around her. What's that tell you? That tells you there was an ancient knowledge, an ancient knowledge that was dispersed to the ends of the world a long time ago, and each culture accommodated it to itself. See what I mean? Use their own, their own names, their own culture, their own take on it, but it comes back to the beginning. You can look up into the heavens and there's a constellation called Coma. It is a woman with a child. God put that up there, okay? Now, we come down to 2017. How many believe in the virgin birth? All right. Do you believe the virgin brought forth a child? The Lord Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, it's what he prophesied in Isaiah chapter number 7. <coughs> in verse number 14, behold a, child, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a child. Matthew makes it plain. He quotes Isaiah. And he quotes Isaiah in reference to the birth of Christ being a virgin-born son. Now here's the problem. The pagan world is full of women with children in their lap. So you go over here to comparative religions at UT or Kentucky or anywhere for that matter. You sit down in the class. Professor gets up in front of you and he starts giving you this stuff and telling you that this, all of this Christian tradition about a virgin about a virgin bearing a son, a child, is nothing in the world more than Western Europeans rehashing all of this old stuff and, and accommodating it to their religion. What would you say back to him? I would say back, Mr. Professor, who put that up there? See, he can't go back any further than that. And I take him to what the Hebrew says about that, the Hebrew names, long before. And it was it not the Hebrew that prophesied that a virgin shall conceive? Was it not the Hebrew that said a seed of the virgin? The seed of the virgin? Virgin doesn't have a seed. This was long before the, the, the botany and biology and DNA and RNA and all that. They didn't know anything about that. Long before anybody knew anything about that. It said in Genesis 3.15 that the man has the seed. That's what it said. You see, that's what I would say to the professor. Please explain to me then who put that coma up there in the heavens and put that name in her eye and prophesied long before these pagans ever started talking about it that a virgin would have a child. That's what I've done. I've taken it back to its source, and I've showed you how that it got perverted down through the centuries. That's what you got to do with them, too, folks. You got to do. You, you can't mess with them because they are vicious. They will undermine your faith in that Bible and your faith in Christ in a heartbeat. And they take pleasure in doing it. Why? Because it gives it pumps up their ego. It reminds them how smart they are. It reminds them that they know so much more than you do, and that's what they live on. This is why the Athenians over there sought some new thing because daily. Who is this babbler, they said, about the Apostle Paul? That's what they called him. They called him a babbler that's preaching new gods and strange gods to us about somebody raising the dead. That's what they called the Apostle Paul, a babbler. So what have I done? I've brought you back to the Bible, and I've told you you can believe the Bible. That's what I've done. 
I've put it, I've, I've, I've planted in your heart the seed once again that the word of God is true and it predates any university on the face of this earth. Any professorship, any PhD, care who he is, it predates them. I've given you the provenance. I've taken you back to the beginning. And so I'm not selling you Jesse James, Smith and Wesson. Oh, I'd love to get my hands on it though. When you talk about a fine bullet, that'd be something. I'll tell you right now, that'd be something to have. But uh, Jesse James, <laughs> Smith & Wesson, I think it was a 44 caliber. I don't know what it was. It doesn't matter. Stuff like that. All right, now, let's see how much time we've got left. What about a little over five minutes here. Uh, we have uh, the, uh, we, brought it, we brought you down to the Virgin, and we've got you, we've, we've brought you through the zodiac. We've talked to you about the mammoth. And 53 million years ago, you know, it'd be interesting to, it really would. It'd be interesting. Now, Professor, tell me something. How did you come to the figure 53 million years? I mean, really. What, what exact science are you using to tell me that this is 53 million years? Obviously, there wasn't anybody around back then. 53 million years, but I, know, I do know what you, I have found. I have found that practically everything starts on this earth as it relates to the heavens, the building of the monuments, and everything else right after 2345 B.C. And what happened in 2345 B.C.? A flood. I found that. 53 million years ago, they need this. Now, I uh, thought I'd mention this to you this morning because this has just come out. A uh, professor, I think it is, over at the UK, United Kingdom, has said that man now has reached the, uh, reached the end of his evolution, that this is it. This is as, this is as far as we're going to get. That's what he said. And they're taking him seriously. Now, think about that for a minute about that. Now what science do, does he base that on? He bases that on the same science that says 53 million years ago uh, palm trees were uh, in, uh, in Antarctica and, and says, you know, his science, the way he explains it, he bases it, uh, that on his science. The truth is, yes, they were there, but I don't buy his science. Amen. All right. Well, that's all I've got right now. I've, I've run out of things to say. I can get up here and ramble on for the next few minutes. Uh, if you have any questions about what I've covered so far, I'll try to help you with them. Otherwise, well, we'll let you go. Yes, ma'am. Okay, well, you get into the exact date of his birth, all right? And uh, the birth of the sun god was December the 25th. All right, if you don't have to do much research to find that. And you'll also find out that Ishtar and Easter are closely connected. Okay. And a lot of you do your own research and you get into stuff like that. And that's good. You need to. Uh, you, need to know, you need to know that the pagan who tries to challenge you on what you're doing, he needs to know you know what he knows. And you still believe your Bible. Number one, Christ was born. How many believe that? No question about it. No, none whatsoever. He was, he was born. He was also conceived, and nine months later he was born, right? Exactly. He was conceived. He had a first cousin that was six months older than him, right? Elizabeth's son, John the Baptist, that was Christ's first cousin. All right, so he's six months older than the Lord. Uh, I don't know the exact birth date of Christ. I don't know. I think if the Bible had wanted us to know it, put it in there, you know? I think that. I can also see how that this pagan mythology has an element of truth in it. Can't you? I mean, we're looking back at Semiramis, the, the mother of God, you know, Theotokos is what, uh, is, what it, is the Greek word for that. But the idea with, 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 with Semiramis being the mother of God is that she predates Christ, which means that she predates God, which means she's greater than God. That's the problem with the term mother of God. But 
You trace it all the way down and you've got December the 25th is the birthday. Now, December the 21st, which is just 10 days from now, is the winter solstice. Shortest day of the year. Day starts getting longer. And I do know this. I know that the pagan world is definitely connected with, 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 with the seasons and the solstices. Yes, it is. It certainly is. No question about that. Uh, a lot of people believe he was born in September. They believe he was born in September somewhere. Maybe I've, one, one I've read most is about 20th or 21st, somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah. September, or maybe up to the 25th of September, somewhere in that period of time. I don't know how anybody could name it, tie it down to an exact date. You can't prove it one way or the other. And so he says October the 10th. Alexander Hislop? The two Babylons? Okay. Uh, The, the common, the common way that, they, that this is this is handled is that the Roman Catholic Church, when it incorporated all of the pagan religions, they try to accommodate them, and when they do, they accommodate some of their their saints and some of their dates and stuff like that. And so they incorporated December the twenty fifth because of the pagans around them, birthday of the sun god, and they just made that the birthday of Christ. That's the common uh, take on it. Of course he is. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, we do. We have a lot of things that have come down to us in tradition, no question about that. I mean, if you want to do a research into all of that, you'll be amazed at the stuff you do every day that has definite connections with paganism. All the days of the week, every day of the week, the, day, the, the months, the name of the months, they're all pagan in origin. Yes, sir. Long time ago and land far away. That's that's true. <laughs> it can't. Once upon a time, and that's where they started. Yeah, once upon a time. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I have no problem with December the twenty fifth. I don't worship the day. I worship Christ. And the day after and the day before, I still worship Christ. Love Him. Give my life to Him. And bless His righteous name. Don't worry about the date. Just make sure you know the one that it's about. All right, brother. You just.